Okay, hi everyone, good morning. It is 9 a.m. here in Vancouver. Thank you so much for joining us in our tutorial, All Things VIPs, which is done in collaboration with the amazing Sai Paul, who will be joining us remotely, you'll see him soon. Thank you so much for joining us and I hope you'll enjoy the next three hours with us. So maybe let's start with a quick introduction of ourselves. My name is Ilan. I'm a PhD candidate at Tel Aviv University and also a, a research intern at Google Tel Aviv. And I'll let Sayak introduce himself via Zoom. Um, All right. Can everyone see and hear me? Yeah, we can see and hear you. Hi, Sayak. Good evening. Yeah, uh, it's almost almost uh, the time for me to say good night from uh, India. But here we go. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sayak, and thanks uh, to Hila for visiting Vancouver in person and for being there to present our tutorial uh, in person. Uh, sorry, the visa issues are beyond my control. That's why I couldn't be present there. Uh, but I really would like to welcome you all. Uh, and I wanted to say a heartfelt thanks for stopping by our tutorial. My name is Sayak. I am one of the co-organizers for this tutorial. You will see me around, but virtually. I work on the diffuse team at Hugging Face. And of the work, I like to binge watch suits uh, on Netflix. Uh, and yeah, Hila will walk you through uh, the rest of the logistical stuff, which is pretty important. And then we'll get right to uh, the main meat of uh, our tutorial. So Hila, I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Sayak. See you soon. OK. So other than myself and Sayak, we're, we're going to have a guest speaker who we love very much and appreciate him uh, joining us. His name is On Mukadi. He just graduated his PhD from Tel Aviv University and is now a research lead at uh, Biotech AI. And now that we know everyone who's going to uh, be presenting in this tutorial, let's go over the content of the tutorial itself. Now we're doing a short introduction and some logistics. Um, then we're going to talk about attention in a Jiffy, right? So we're going to understand attention before we try to probe it or explain it, which is kind of important. Then we're going to talk about how to probe vision transformers, how to explain uh, predictions by vision transformers, and how to use attention as an explanation, if possible, in some cases. Um, we're going to wrap it up with how to use attention for downstream tasks, which is image editing or text to image generation, which I'm sure will be exciting for all of us. And then we'll end with open questions and conclusions, which will hopefully jaunt your imagination for future works that are possible in the field, because there are many, many open questions that I hope will be intriguing for all of us. So just a few logistics about the tutorial. We'll have multiple short breaks, so don't worry. It's not going to be three hours straight of you listening to us speak. Um, also, we love, love, love questions and discussions. So please feel free to leave your questions on Rocket Chat or approach during uh, the breaks. Or we do have a mic here for the people attending in person. Um, but the people on Zoom cannot hear you. So what we're going to do is we're going to have methodical breaks for questions. You're going to go ahead and approach the mic, ask the question. I'm going to repeat it for the people via Zoom and answer the question. And a very important disclaimer about this tutorial, like any other tutorial, right? We're covering a lot of ground in just three hours. It is entirely possible that we're missing some really important and nice works that have been published recently. Um, we're apologizing for that ahead of time. But if you do find that there's some work that is missing from us, our slides, we'd be happy to correct that error. Just email us, talk to us. It is entirely possible that we're missing some amazing work since there are so many works being published in this field. And not really trivial nowadays, but we think it's really important. So all the content of this tutorial is going to be hosted uh, publicly for everyone to see including the slides, the demos, the code, everything is going to be available on our website. So you can go ahead and just scan the QR code. Everything is going to be available, open source, and as approachable as possible for you to be able to use uh, all of our materials and reproduce all of the results that we're showing you here. I'm seeing that people are taking pictures, so I'll give you one more second to do that. OK, at the end of each slide, we're going to have uh, a resource slide such that you can approach uh, all the papers that we presented, all the demos, all the code. Everything is going to be in the slides. So 
really no need to take pictures. Once the tutorial is over, you can just go to, to the website and uh, check out the slides and, and uh, see everything there, all the content. Okay, let's get started. <laughs> so part one is an introduction to transformers. We're not really assuming any prior knowledge on anything. So I'm going to give a lot of intuitions as to how transformers work and how the attention mechanism works. And hopefully we'll all be on the same page once we're uh, up to the point of probing and explaining. So the overview of this part is as follows. First, we're going to talk about how the transformer was even, even born, right? So the transformer was born for NLP um, and it was born to replace recurrent neural networks. And then we're going to talk about the process of moving from RNNs to transformers and why that happened. Then we're going to talk about the star of this entire tutorial, right? The attention mechanism. I'm going to try to give you as many intuitions as possible. Right, so this uh, speaker status, we have like uh, two from uh, academia and five from industry, so that we have a more uh, diverse background. So okay. okay, I have no idea what just happened. So sorry for that. <laughs> okay, so as I said, I'm going to try to give you as much intuition as possible about attention, because I think it's going to be just the star of this tutorial and basically the star of any deep learning model you come across right nowadays, even generative models. Um, we're going to talk about why transformers have multiple attention heads, right? The beast with many heads. Um, then we're going to touch on positional encoding and why that is needed, especially for transformer encoders. And then we're going to talk about the transition from self-attention to cross-attention, because that's going to be very important when we touch on generative models, okay? So ready, let's go. So in the beginning, there were RNNs. So RNNs were the state-of-the-art architecture used for NLP models. And what RNNs do, they're recurrent neural networks. Um, and they fit their name, right? They uh, process the sequence or the words in the sentence, word by word, one word by one word. And as you see, we have a single architecture here, A, that is applied to each word in the sequence. And as you can see, the RNN takes the first word in the sentence, processes it, and outputs a hidden state H0. And then in the next step, we're going to take the next word in the sentence, the uh, hidden state that we had from the previous step, and calculate the next hidden state. And this is repeated until we've processed the entire sequence. Um, and this was kind of the state of the art uh, in RNN or variations of it, right? LSTMs, BILSTMs, these were the state of the art models used for NLP up until 2017, when attention is all you need came out. So let's try to understand the motivation of why not sticking to RNNs or what are the main issues with sticking with RNNs. So the first one is sequential processing. So as we said, RNNs process the input word by word, right? It's sequential. So in order to process the entire input, we have to process uh, everything word by word. So in order to process X1, we have to first process X0 and so on. So this process is very expensive in time, right? It takes a lot of time. And if you have a very long sequence, it's going to take a long time to process the entire sequence and obtain your final hidden state HD. So that's the first problem. That's a runtime problem. The second problem is localization. So if you think about it, once we reach time step T, the first time step, the X0 is very, very far from time step T. And researchers have shown that these RNNs suffer from um, localization where the uh, hidden state HT mostly depends on its closest neighbors. So therefore, the uh, first hidden states or the first words are less influential on the output hidden state. Therefore, we have some kind of a bias uh, that each hidden state is in influenced by the words that are closest to it. And then we fail to kind of attend to the information that is in the beginning of the sequence. And the last uh, shortcoming that RNNs have is single direction context, right? So X1 could only look at X0 when calculating its hidden state. X2 could only look at X1 and X0. So the context that we're getting is from a single direction of the input. Um, BIOSTMs kind of solve that when we process the information from both directions and then output a hidden state that is kind of a computation of both. But then each direction is limited just to that single direction. So we're not getting context from all over uh, the sequence as we would like to have. So these are actually the issues of RNNs that led to the birth of the transformer. So I'm sure you've all heard of uh, the paper Attention is All You Need, which was published in 2017 and really made a revolution in the deep learning world, starting from NLP and then expanding to other uh, domains. 
So as you can see, this architecture is actually really simple and clean, right? It maybe contains the most basic building blocks that we can think about in neural networks. So we have feed forward layers, um, skip connections and normalization layers. So everything here is really, really basic. A clean and simple architecture, which was kind of the selling point of attention is all you need, right? That's the title. You, all you need is just attention. And then the only logical units that are kind of interesting or maybe unique are those orange attention units. So as you can see, we have an encoder here, which is going to be the focus of this talk because we're talking about vision and mostly in vision, we're using the encoder information. And then we also have the decoder. Um, and then both of them have self-attention units that you can see here in orange. And the decoder also has a cross-attention unit. And observe that the cross-attention unit takes information from the encoder and incorporates it into the decoder. So we're going to talk later about what cross-attention is and how it's useful, specifically in vision. But let's first understand why transformers are so seminal in the deep learning field. Um, before transformers, we kind of had proprietary architectures for each one of the dif disciplines in deep learning. So computer vision had CNNs, and NLP had RNNs and LSTMs, and RL had their own you know, set of architectures, and speech ha had their own set of architectures, and translation, their own set of architectures. So all those disciplines of the same main field of deep learning had their own proprietary architectures with their own inductive biases, right? And then once the transformer was published, it actually took over all disciplines. So slowly but surely, it kind of replaced all the discipline-specific architectures. And it was shown that attention is really useful for all disciplines in deep learning. So this is why the transformer is so important and so seminal uh, in the research of deep learning, because it is simply applicable to any, almost any domain you can think about, right? So this is why this architecture is so important. Okay, so let's talk about what the transformer did solve we saw some of the shortcomings of RNNs, right? Um, so instead of processing the information sequentially, the transformer processes all the information together, okay? So there's no sequential processing of token by token by token by token. And again, we're talking about encoders, okay? Not decoders during this entire talk. Um, the yeah. localization issue... <laughs> the localization issue was solved as well, since we can now process the entire sequence together and gain context from all other tokens in the sequence. And then single direction context was solved, again, inherently with the attention mechanism since it processes all information at once. Okay? So basically, it solved the three maybe most prominent issues that RNN had. Um, it should be noted, and it is important to note, that attention was used before the transformers, okay? So attention did exist before the transformer was born, but it was mostly used to kind of connect information between the encoder and the decoder. So we had those RNNs, which were the heart of, of the models, those recurrent units, and then the attention was used as kind of a supporting mechanism to mitigate between the information uh, of the encoder and the decoder, right? So attention did exist, but it was minor. It wasn't the heart. Of, of the model. And then in attention is all you need, the authors basically said, you don't need any other architecture, you don't need any other building block, attention is enough to cover all the operations that were previously performed by different uh, models. Okay, so now that we're done with the introduction, and hopefully we understand why attention is so important, why transformers are so seminal to the field, let's talk about attention and what attention does. So the purpose of attention is to create contextualized representations for each input token. So that's a really long and maybe not so understandable sentence, but let's try to break it down. Say we have this input sentence, the cat sat on the mat and this cute sat, cat sitting on a mat. Um, as humans, we know to contextualize each word in the sequence. So for example, the word the, the first word the on its own, has no real meaning. So as humans, we know to relate the first word the to the word cat. So this is contextualization. We know how to take information from different parts of the sentence and assign them to the word that we're interested in. So basically here we contextualize the word the with the word cat. And in the same way, we know how to contextualize the second word the with the word mat. So contextualization is something that is really natural to us as humans. And this is exactly what the attention mechanism does. So the goal of the attention mechanism is to take each one of these words, each one of these tokens, and create a representation that contains information from the other relevant parts of the sentence. 
Any questions so far? Feel free to go to the mic. Anything? Okay, super, everything's clear. So let's talk about how the attention mechanism does this intuitively. And again, this is a very, very intuitive mechanism. So I hope you'll agree with me by the time I finish this uh, intuitive explanation. So attention kind of works in a similar way to retrieval from databases. So we've all worked with databases and we know that they have three main entities, the queries, the keys, and the values. And then the queries are kind of like the question that we're running on the database, right? Find star where ID equals something, right? So the same thing applies to the attention mechanism. We want to create contextualized representations, say for the word the. We're going to run a query on the other words to find the words that are relevant to the word the, okay? And then the keys are just like the keys in the database. So the keys map the values. We can compare the queries to the keys and extract the values according to the comparison between the queries and the keys. So again, we're running a query, a question on the entire database. The query is compared to the keys. We extract the keys that are relevant to the query that we ran. And then we can obtain the values that correspond to the actual objects, okay? That correspond to our query. So this is exactly what the attention mechanism does. It takes our input sequence, which is marked here as X, and it maps it to queries, keys, and values using three linear projection matrices. So you have WQ, WK, and WV, which map the input sequence to the queries, the keys, and the values. And then the attention calculation is done in two steps. The first step is to actually extract the value, the, the uh, other uh, tokens that are relevant to the current token, right? So as I said, we calculate a query, a key, and a value for each token in the sentence. For example, here, the sentence is just thinking machines. So we have query one for thinking, query two for machines, key one for thinking, key, one, key two for machines, and value one for thinking, value one for machines. Now, our goal is to extract the keys that are relevant to the query that we're running right now. Say we're running the query for the word thinking. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to assess how relevant each one of the words is to the word thinking. So this is going to be done by a dot product between the query and the key of each one of the tokens. So query one times key one actually represents the attention score of thinking with regards to itself. How much thinking is influential on itself, okay? And then query one times key two is going to reflect how influential the word machine is on the word thinking, okay? So these are actually the attention scores that we're calculating. These attention scores are kind of like relevance scores, how much each token is relevant to the current token that we're processing. And this is done mathematically using just a matrix multiplication of the queries and the keys. And this is normalized by softmax such that all these values sum to one. As you can see here, after the softmax, uh, both the values, both attention values sum to one. Okay, so we can see here that for example, the word thinking is going to influ be, be influenced by mostly itself and machines is not going to have a lot of influence on the word thinking, okay? So after we've calculated these attention scores, we turn to actually do the contextualization, okay? So the, context the contextualization is done by taking uh, a linear combination of these words weighted by the attention values. So the actual contextualization is going to be taking value one and multiplying it by uh, the attention score of, of the first token and taking value two and multiplying it by the, by the attention score of, uh, of, the second, uh, of the second token machines. So what we have right now is an input of an image, which we want to add information from text, from the textual domain to. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to use the exact same attention mechanism that we've just discussed, only we're going to take the queries from the image and the keys and the values from the text, okay? So let's discuss the intuition that we talked about before. So we said the queries are kind of like the semantic questions, right, that we're asking. So what this mechanism will do is it will ask the semantic questions from the image and give the answers, oh, sorry, give the answers or the information to, for the contextualization from the text. So basically what we're doing when we're taking the queries from one domain and the keys and the values from another domain is we're taking the context or taking the information from the text and inserting it into the image. And the image is free to kind of ask the text or query the text on any semantic information that it sees fit. Okay? So this is a cross-attention mechanism. And we're a bit behind. 
Um, so this wraps up the first part of our tutorial. The papers that we discussed are basically just attention is all you need. And we've also mentioned uh, the great blog post, The Illustrated Transformer by Jed Alama. I really, really recommend reading it because I kind of skimmed through the entire attention mechanism and the entire transformer architecture, and I didn't really pay attention to the decoder at all. So if you're interested and want to read more, I really recommend this blog post, which some of my slides were based on. So thank you so much. This wraps up our first part of the tutorial. We're going to have a five minute break right now and then go back to the second part, probing. Okay, so the five minute break is over. I'm so sorry it was so short. So we're going to move on to the second part of the tutorial, which is uh, probing transformers. And uh, this part will be given by Sayak. So I'm just going to play the recording. If you have any questions for Sayak, since he's not present here, feel free to just join Rocket Chat, okay, and leave your questions there. And then I'm sure Sayak will be thrilled to answer your questions. So I'll just yield the floor to virtual Sayak. Hello. Welcome to uh, part two of our tutorial, uh, where we will discuss how to probe the representations learned by vision transformers and how to compare the representations uh, to the representations learned by convolutional neural networks, uh, such as ResNets. Here's an overview uh, of the tools that we will use uh, in this section. We will start by discussing the idea of mean attention distance uh, uh, to discuss how uh, vision transformers learn global and local contexts, unlike uh, CNNs. Uh, then we will resort to centered kernel alignment uh, to be able to compare the representations learned by WITS uh, and ResNets. And finally, uh, we will discuss the roll of skip connections uh, in vision transformers and ResNets. Uh, now, to set the context, uh, Right, uh, we I wanted to quickly discuss uh, what vision transformers are, uh, at least the uh, primary components. And for that, I'm going to have to shamelessly steal slides from Lucas Baird, uh, who is uh, one of the authors of vision transformers. Now, the main idea here uh, is to extract small patches uh, from in input images and feed them uh, to embedding layers to compute linear projections. And to those embeddings, uh, we basically prepend uh, another class embedding, which is learnable, which is like extracting embedding from a CLS token, uh, similar to BERT. And to those embeddings, we add position embeddings. And rest of the process is exactly the same for how you would do that uh, for, for, for the transformer encoder blocks uh, in NLP. So the key and in insight uh, shared in the vision transform paper was this, the patchification part and how to compute embeddings uh, of those patches uh, and use, uh, uh, use the exact same transformer encoder architecture uh, for the image classification task. And similar to BERT, we pull the representation uh, for, uh, associated uh, with the CLS token, and then we feed that uh, to the classification head. Now, even with all the uh, classification numbers, how do we know uh, if this approach is effective at all uh, from a deeper uh, perspective? Because locality is important for computer vision. Uh, and uh, if, if, if you paid uh, attention to the earlier slide, you would have noticed that there's literally, there's little to no inductive bias present in a vision transformer uh, that will uh, help that will help to learn locality in the first place but at the same time having a global context uh, is equally important uh, especially for dense prediction tasks uh, like semantic segmentation object detection and so on so how do uh, wits learn locality uh, and is there any similarity uh, in between the representations learned by uh, cnns and wits and what are uh, their repercussion, repercussions, even if there's little to no similarity? So uh, these are the two questions and that we will primarily focus on in this section. So our first tool of analysis uh, would be the mean attention distance investigated uh, in the initial vision transformer paper. Uh, and uh, 
MAD, uh, which is short for mean attention distance, is defined uh, to be the geometric distance between two patches scaled by their attention values. So uh, a high MAD would denote that the distant patches receive high attention values and low MAD would denote that uh, relatively close patches receive high attention values. Now in the animation, uh, the row and the column of a, part, uh, of a particular patch is indicated uh, on the image uh, and their geometric uh, distance is calculated by the uh, norm of the difference in between the uh, patches uh, times uh, the patch size. Now here are some interesting observations. If we closely uh, look at this plot, we will notice uh, that the lower uh, lower layers in uh, in the vision transformer network, they tend to have a good mixture uh, of of local uh, and global contexts, uh, which we quantify uh, using a mean attention distance introduced uh, earlier. And the higher layers within the network, they tend to focus mostly on the global context. And this behavior actually does not change much, even when uh, we use a convolutional prior uh, by uh, using the feature maps computed uh, from a ResNet 50 and by making the vision transform network operate uh, on the feature maps computed using uh, ResNet 50. As we can see, uh, this behavior does not change much, even when a conf prior uh, is introduced in the network. Now, there seems to be a strong connection in between uh, mean attention distance, the pre-training data being used, along with the WIT architecture uh, being used. So on the left-hand side, I have a very deep vision transformer network that was pre-trained on the JFT 300 million dataset, uh, which was subsequently fine-tuned on the ImageNet 1K dataset. Uh, and on the right-hand side, uh, I have the same uh, same with model, but it was pre-trained only on the ImageNet 1K dataset, which is orders of uh, magnitude smaller uh, than the JFT 300 million dataset. Now, this plot is slightly different uh, from what we saw earlier. Uh, here, we are plotting the mean attention distance from individual attention heads uh, from different uh, transformer encoder blocks, and we we see that when when the pre-training dataset uh, is larger and when we are particularly using a deeper architecture, uh, the network, uh, the earlier earlier layers in the network, they tend to learn uh, locality. Uh, but in absence of a larger uh, pre-training data set, uh, the deeper weight model, uh, they do not learn locality uh, at all, which becomes evident uh, with the plot on the right hand side. But if we if we change the uh, architecture uh, and the path size, uh, this uh, the story changes. Right here on the left hand side, I I have a smaller uh, architecture which was pre-trained on the GFT three hundred million dataset, and on the right hand side I have the same architecture but it was pre-trained on the ImageNet one K dataset, and the behavior uh, remains the same here. Uh, so the path size, so there's there's an interplay of path size architecture uh, uh, and the uh, and the pre-training dataset uh, being used here. Uh, so that also uh, plays a direct role on how the mean attention uh, distance is going to develop uh, is going to be developed throughout the training process. So some observations at this point in time become evident is that without enough data, lower layers in bits, uh, they do not tend to learn locality. And this becomes quite evident in the deeper architectures of bit. And with enough pre-training data, lower layers learn to encode locality early, early on uh, in the network, uh, which could be an indicator uh, for good performance. And from the plots on uh, mean attention distance, uh, it, it also became evident uh, that bit layers have access to global information almost uniformly. And in the next couple of slides, 
we will discuss what are it, what are its repercussions now here here the primary motivation is that cnns do not uh, combine both local and global information like vids do and does this lead to differences uh, in their representation space well the spoiler is yes it does so here here in this section we will try to compare the representations learned by a vision transformer network and the representations learned by a, by an equal sized uh, resnet model so to be able to do that uh, we need a quantifiable quantifiable way to measure the differences in between the representations uh, from neural architectures and we will use uh, the centered kernel alignment uh, and this paradigm uh, was introduced in the similarity of neural network representations revisited uh, paper so yeah and we will primarily uh, use centered kernel alignment for this uh, is because it has uh, two excellent properties uh, which is it's invariant to orthogonal transformations of representations which is to say even we permute the order of the neurons uh, the ck will remain invariant to that and it's also invariant to isotropic scaling that is when we scale each dimension uh, of the of the embeddings uniformly it still remains invariant and here's here's a bit of a map uh, we start by uh, computing uh, the activations uh, from specific layers uh, within the network and then we compute gram matrices uh, out of those uh, activations and then we compute the hilbert schmidt independence criterion uh, and here's a mo more elaborate formulation of cka so the normalization term there it it actually ensures that cka remains uh, invariant uh, to isotropic scaling now let's get to the meat of it uh, so here we are doing a sort of intra network comparison uh, on the upper hand i have the ck heat map uh, for the vision transformer networks two variants uh, of uh, vision transformer and on the lower hand i have two variants uh, of resnets and two observations immediately become uh, uh, evident uh, one is uh, which show more uniform similarities uh, between both lower and higher layers uh, whereas resnets show uniform similarities in like halves uh, like uh, the representations computed from the lower layers uh, in resnets they are very different from that of uh, the higher layers but that's apparently not the case for vision transformers they are much more uniform uh and let's let's take it a step further uh, where we try to do the internet for comparison where we take representations computed from different layers uh, from a bit uh, and and exactly the same but for a resnet and we see that wits wits are able to compute uh, smaller features uh, similar features as resnets but with a smaller set of layers and this probably leaves a space for vision transformers to learn more and more abstract features uh, during their training process and wits also propagate features more faithfully uh, across layers uh, and features across higher layers in wits uh, vary significantly uh, uh, to that of the resnets now uh, now I, I i would like to discuss the role of skip connections and how how that varies uh, in in vision transformers uh, and resnets now at this point in time we saw that uh wits representation space is uniform and information from lower layers in wits is propagated to the higher layers much more faithfully than resnets now how that's the question we will try to uh, find find an answer for now the setup is uh, is to plot the norm ratio of the following so zi is basically uh the representations uh, from the skip connection and f of uh, zi uh, it's basically transformation uh, applied uh, applied to uh, applied on the uh, applied on zi which is basically the long branch uh, such as the self attention block or the mlp block so yeah
And here's here's the plot where the zeroth index uh, denote the CLS token, and the rest of the indices on the x-axis uh, denote the spatial tokens. Now, if we look closely, uh, we will uh, we will observe a clear phase transition in between the CLS uh, and the spatial tokens, uh, where where the first half uh, where in the first half skip connections propagate uh, the CLS token, which denotes a uh, high norm ratio, uh, whereas uh, whereas the uh, spatial tokens uh, get their major contributions uh, from the longer branch, uh, which which de which is denoted by uh, the lower norm ratio. And this is this is true for for the first half of the network, but this gets exactly reversed uh, uh, in the uh, later half of the network, where skip connections propagate the spatial tokens uh, uh, more. Now, here's a comparative plot uh, uh, in between the role of the skip connections uh, in widths and resnets. And skip connections actually uh, behave very differently in widths uh, and resnets. And overall, we, we observe a, a low norm ratios uh, as far as resnets are uh, concerned. So this kind of, this kind of indicates that uh, skip connections play uh, a much more influential, in, influential role uh, in modeling and propagating the representations across different layers in bits than, uh, th than they do uh, in resonance. And if we start remo removing the skip connections, uh, it, it tends to disrupt the uniformity of the representation space in bits. Like if we remove the skip connection from uh, first uh, transformer block, probably it does not disrupt much. But if we start removing it uh, from a higher, higher end, then uh, the uniformity gets immediately disrupted. Now, this is probably a bit out of scope uh, for this tutorial. Uh, but WIT's uniform representation structure also impacts robustness uh, as far as robustness uh, benchmarks are concerned in computer vision. Uh, robustness uh, with respect to corruption, robustness with respect to natural adversarial examples, and so on. Now, here's a list of the resources uh, that we discussed. And as a further reading, I welcome you to check out the last paper, uh, which has got lots of cool visuals. And I also welcome you to check out the mean attention distance collab notebook. And I encourage you to try out uh, different vision transformer networks uh, and investigating their mean attention distances. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Zach, for this interesting uh, overview of attention probing. Uh, we'll take another five minute break and then we'll get right back to explaining. Okay, so we are back to talking about part three, which is a part very close to my heart because this is my research. <laughs> we're going to talk about explaining transformers. Okay, so uh, in this section, we're going to touch on intro to explainability, okay? And why explainability is even interesting, a great question. Uh, the second thing we're going to touch on is why not just use algorithms adapted from CNNs? And why do we need specific algorithms for transformers, right? The third thing we're going to ask ourselves is, is attention an explanation? And then we're going to touch on algorithms to explain transformers. So let's start with the motivation. Why are explanations even interesting? There's a very famous and uh, a quote that I love from Dan Brown. We all fear what we do not understand, right? So in this era where we have generative models and everyone's talking about ChatGPT being a risk to humanity, I think the best way to probably resolve all these questions is to understand the models, right? So we're building these huge models that we're feeding a lot of data into, but we don't really understand what the model actually learned. So the science of explainability is a task with developing tools and frameworks to help you better understand these amazing models that you just built and trained with a lot of data. And here's an example from ChatGPT as to why explainability is so important. So this example wasn't uh, produced by us. It was produced by this uh, article here that you can, of course, uh, take a look at later. Um, so the author asked, how did you come to the conclusion that she refers to paralegal? And then ChatGPT says, you are correct. I apologize for the mistake. She refers to the attorney and not the paralegal. 
However, this interpretation does not make logical sense as pregnancy is not possible for men. Okay, so here's a, an explicit bias that is really obvious from ChatGPT. He thinks a paralegal, or it thinks a paralegal has to be a woman, an attorney has to be a man. And if an attorney is actually a woman, then it's not possible for the attorney to be pregnant because the attorney has to be a man. Okay, so even if sometimes we're not seeing the bias directly, and this is the type of biases that I think is most risky, because sometimes the bias is implicit and not explicit. And then the model produces predictions that are based on an underlying bias that we cannot identify from just the prediction. Okay, so this makes this field so important, especially nowadays. So in the beginning, we used mainly linear classifiers. And then linear classifiers are self-explanatory, right? You're learning kind of uh, weight for each one of the features in your vector. And then you can understand quite intuitively what the model learned according to these weights. So features that are weighted heavily are important for the prediction. And features that are not weighted heavily are not important for the prediction. And the model was really self-explanatory. But when we're talking about models like ChatGPT, the explanation is not really clear. What even serves as an explanation for generative models? Okay, so this field is really at a turning point right now. And it is really important to try to understand what these models actually work, how these models actually work. So if you're interested in explaining generative models, um, this is not going to be the focus of this tutorial because we're going to talk about attention and how to explain attention. But uh, explaining generative models is really interesting. And I will refer you to a new preprint that uh, I just published. Um, it has to do with diffusion models. In diffusion models, you take an input text prompt and then uh, you generate images from the input text prompt. And what we're doing in this work is we're actually able to take a concept, a textual concept, and explain how the model understands a concept. So for example, here we took the concept of photo of a president. And you can see that the model learns to embed a president as just a linear combination of existing uh, American presidents. Here we show other examples of explaining single image predictions. So as you can see, the model makes connections between uh, semantic concepts that are not similar to humans. This is one of the examples that I like the most. So we have an oak tree, and we can see that the model constructs the oak tree as a sequoia tree, just a tree structure plus a stag. So you can see that the structure of the tree is taken from the sequoia, but then the color of the tree is taken from the stag's body and the branches of the tree from the stag's horns. So this is not a connection that we would make as humans, but it is a connection that uh, vision models make. And it makes sense. They connect concepts based on shapes and colors and so on. Here's another example of a snake being generated as hose plus gecko. So shape plus texture. Another example of sweet peppers are just fingers plus pepper, okay? So another thing that we're able to do with this method is actually decompose the concept and find uh, biases. So some of the biases are gender biases as we saw before. So a secretary is modeled as actress, hostess, women, ladies, girls, and so on. Opera singers are fat, obese, and overweight. Journalists, this stuck a chord with me specifically because I'm Jewish, um, are modeled as partly Jews, right? And uh, drinking is modeled as millennials, uh, drunk, blonde, and so on, et cetera. So these biases that we're seeing here are not necessarily biases that we would capture by just looking at the image, but explaining the model is really important because once we explain the model, we can see its internal logic, okay? So this is just a side note about explaining generative models. If you're interested, this is a new preprint called The Hidden Language of Diffusion Model. Feel free to go ahead and read it. But going back to the topic of this talk, um, when we talk about explainability, we have two types of explainable AI algorithms roughly, okay? One is model specific, and model specific means that your algorithm uses the internal architecture of the model to create the explanation, right? It uses the linear activations, the uh, skip connections, the, the internal structure of the network. And a good example for that is GradTel. Um, and another type of explainability algorithm is model agnostic. And model agnostic algorithms do not assume anything about the algorithm. They just look at it as a black box and create an explanation based on this black box ability to kind of probe the model. And a good example for that would be shop or line. Okay, so here's the disclaimer. We're not going to cover all explainability methods, right? There are so many 
great ones. If we're missing one of them, we're truly sorry in advance. But here are some algorithms that preceded the transformer. So even before the transformer came out, there were tons of algorithms to explain deep neural networks. RADCAM, integrated gradients, input times gradient, kernel shaft, LIME, deep lift, and so many more. So the question becomes, why do we even need specific algorithms to explain transformers or explain predictions by transformers? So the reason is twofold. The first reason is that here for transformers, we use attention. And attention is very, very different from convolution. We talked about it a bit in the first part of the tutorial. We have different uh, uh, semantic biases and, and different uh, assumptions that CNNs make and transformers don't make. And then for transformers, the classification is done mainly via a classification token, which we'll see later. But then the classification token is not actual information from the input image, OK? And then the classification is done entirely different than how it is done for CNNs. And therefore, when we try, this is work uh, that we uh, showed at CVPR21, we tried using algorithms for CNNs on transformers and it worked really poorly. You can see here GradCam or LRP producing the results that are really not consistent with the input image. And that's why we need algorithms to specifically explain transformers. So the next question we're going to ask ourselves is again, a deep dive into attention, okay? Is attention an explanation? And let's try to understand how we can think of attention as an explanation, okay? This is actually used in a lot of papers and it's going to return back uh, when we talk about generative models, so it's an important part. So as we said, the first part of calculating the uh, attention mechanism is calculating the attention scores. Recall multiplying the queries and the keys and having the softmax. Remember that from the first part of the tutorial? So we can look at these attention values as just an attention matrix. Okay, each one of these values are multiplications between the queries and the keys. So for example, this is the multiplication between query one and key one. And this is the multiplication between query one and key two and so on, okay? So due to the use of softmax, each one of these uh, rows sums to one, right? So we define a distribution for each one of the tokens given all the other tokens, as you can see here. So for example, the distribution for the token the, in the example of the cat set on the mat, shows that most information will come from the cat, right? 0.9 in the distribution. And some information will, will come from sat, and then the other tokens will have almost no influence. As we said before, softmax is very polarizing, right? And then, as I mentioned, classification for transformers is done mostly via the classification token. And the classification token is a token that is appended to the sequence, OK? It doesn't really represent a token inside the sequence. It's an additional token that is appended in the beginning of the attention mechanism. And its goal is kind of to create a global representation. You can think about it as kind of like as global average pooling of your entire information from the sequence. And then the classification token is going to get attention values as well, right, during the attention mechanism. And at the very end, what we're going to do to make the classification, we're going to dump all the other tokens, T1, T2, T3. We're going to only regard the classification token and use that information to make the prediction. Okay, so how can we derive an explanation from that? The idea is just to take the row in the attention matrix corresponding to the classification token. And when we talk about uh, vision transformers, the patches are just the tokens. I mean, each one of the tokens just represents a single patch in the image, okay? So what we can do is we can take the attention values for the different patches in the image and visualize them in a hit map. So the patches that get high attention values will get red values in the heat map. And the patches that get very low attention values will get small uh, or blue values in the heat map. And as you can see here, we create a direct mapping between the attention values that we calculated during the operation of the mechanism, the attention mechanism, and a kind of an explainability map or a heat map. Okay, so this is the way that we map attention to an explanation. And it seems pretty intuitive, right? The classification token is the only token making the prediction at the very end. And these attention values actually tell us how much information is going to be transferred from each patch to the classification token. Therefore, it kind of seems like an intuitive explanation to the prediction by the transformer, right? So let's talk about why this is not a good explanation. <laughs> the first one is, as we said, uh, the transformer is the beast with many heads. And we talked about having different attention heads with different purposes, right? So this classification row is not a single classification row, but we have classification rows for each one of the different attention heads, right? 
So we have the attention values for each one of the different attention heads. And how do we know how to average across the different attention heads? We saw both in the first part and in the math score that Sayak showed you that the, uh, uh, the different attention heads va vary significantly from each other, right? They have very different purposes, very different meanings. So just averaging across the different attention heads seems oversimplistic because we don't account for the meaning of each head. And then the second problem is that we have a deep neural network. So this attention mechanism does not occur just one. Each layer of the transformer adds contextualization, right? So the attention mechanism happens in the first layer, in the second layer, in the third layer, and so on until the last layer. So say we're in the second layer. Uh, the token two first represented patch two in the image. But then after the first attention mechanism, patch two gained information or gained context from the other tokens in the image, right? So now T2 does not necessarily represent patch two. It represents patch two and information from other patches as well. So what's the meaning of token two, token three in the last layer of the attention mechanism? It's not necessarily the same patches that we begin with. So that actually confuses a bit the process. So each algorithm that we're going to talk about to explain attention needs to answer these two questions. First, how do we average across the different attention heads? And second, how do we account for the different contextualization in the different attention layers? So the first algorithm that we're going to discuss is called attention rollout, uh, published by Abnaratel, Samir Abnaratel. Um, and they solve the two problems, maybe in the most simplistic and intuitive way that we can think about. They average the uh, attention heads using just an averaging, right? Taking the different attention heads, the different attention values, and simply taking the average of everything. And aggregation across the layers is done via matrix multiplication, okay? Just multiplying the attention matrices along the different layers. Let's take a look at a visualization to try to understand how this is done. So we have uh, the sentence, keep it fun. And you can see that uh, this graph is constructed as an attention graph, okay, across the layers. So this is the first attention layer. You see the attention values here, 0 0.5, 0 0.1, 0 0.4. And this is the second attention layer. You can see the attention values between each one of the, of the tokens in the input. And then we want to understand how much attention or how much information is transferred from keep to fun. So what we're going to do with the rollout mechanism is just track the attention values, right? Track the paths leading between keep and fun. And for each one of those uh, paths, we're going to add the attention value on that path. So the first path is here, times five plus uh, uh, times uh, uh, 1.0.1. Uh, this is the first path here. And we have another path here, 0 0.4 times 0 0.5. And another path here, 0 0.1 times 0 0.4. So we're going to sum the attention on all these paths, and this is going to be the final aggregated attention value for the information passed from keep to fun. Okay, so what we did is simply track the attention and multiply along the, the, attention, uh, the attention paths. So really simple, right? And this is, by the way, after we averaged across the attention heads, right? So we can do that even if we have a complex input of many attention layers. Uh, here you see the classification token and the key to the cabinets. Um, and then we can track the attention values for each pair of tokens, such that we can account for the contextualization between the different attention layers. So what this does is actually unravels the different attention layers and accounts for the uh, mixture of information in each attention layer. So very simple, right? Any questions about that, by the way? Feel free to just reach the microphone. Okay, I guess that's clear to everyone. Um, and then another thing that we have to account for is the skip connections, right? The skip connections in the attention mechanism are really important. So we have a skip connection here uh, between the input before the attention and after the attention. So we can kind of think about it as adding the identity matrix to the attention matrix, basically adding the information from each token to itself, right? Because we're taking the representation before the attention and added it to the representation after the attention. So how they account for it is just take the identity matrix and add that to the, this matrix, this complicated matrix of uh, multiplications of the attention path. Okay, and this is done to account for uh, the residual connections. So basically each token gets an attention of one with regards to itself. Okay, so they do represent other another option to explain transformers. It's called attention flow. Again, 
uh, averaging across the attention heads is done by just an average. And aggregation across the attention layers is done by solving a max flow problem on this graph. But then this method is really computationally expensive and not used in practice. So we'll not go over it uh, during this talk, but I did want to mention it. Um, and let's now discuss the issues with this simple algorithm that we just saw. First of all, as we can understand, the different attention heads have different meanings, right? So just averaging across the different attention heads seems oversimplistic. It seems like you may insert information. Say if you have an attention head that refers to background features or features that are not relevant to the prediction, you kind of average them with the same weight as the other attention heads. So it seems oversimplistic and seems like something that may uh, fail our, our algorithm. And then the second issue is that the attention mechanism is given really, really strong and powerful. But then this algorithm only refers to this attention layer, right? It skips the activation, the linear layers. It skips the entire network other than just the multiplication of queries and keys. So a lot of information is lost here. We know that especially activations are really important, right? So we want to account for all the layers somehow, but still incorporate this intuition of using the attention mechanism as an explanation. Um, so the method that we suggest kind of tries to answer both the issues that I pointed out before. So as to the first issue that we mentioned, instead of just averaging across the different attention heads, we weight the different attention heads by the gradients, such that we calculate the gradient with respect to the prediction, and then heads that are really important to the predictions are going to have high gradients, right? And heads that are very unimportant to the predictions are going to have low gradients such that we can weight each attention head by its influence. And technically this is done as so. Uh, Yt is just the logic that corresponds to the class that we wish to explain. So for example, if the class is cat, we take the logic that corresponds to the cat and we calculate its gradient through, throughout the entire network. And specifically we have the gradients for each one of the attention heads, right? So now that we have the gradient for each one of the attention heads, we can multiply the attention head by its gradient, element by element such that the attention head is weighted by its gradient. And now we can average across the attention heads in a way that takes into account the meaning of different attention heads. So again, the intuition is that important attention heads are going to get high gradients, unimportant attention heads are going to get low gradients, and then the averaging takes into account the meaning of different attention heads in the, in the network. And then the second thing we said was that we do wish to account for other layers in the network, not just the attention mechanism, and specifically not just the multiplication of queries and keys, which calculates the attention values. So what we're going to do is we're not going to use the raw attention values as they are, as they come from the queries multiplication with the keys. We're going to use uh, relevance values calculated by a method called LRP. So LRP is layer-wise relevance propagation. Okay, and the reason that we're using LRP is that LRP has a, a unique guarantee as to uh, the relevance values. It guarantees that the sum of relevancies in each one of the layers of the network is constant. So each one of the layers in the neural networks is, is going to sum, the relevancies are going to sum to one, okay? So that's a guarantee that is really similar to the attention mechanism, right? Because in the attention mechanism, we had each row summing to one, the softmax guarantee that. And another thing about LRP that is special uh, in comparison to gradients is that LRP is, more stable because gradients can be very high, very low, and other explainability algorithms have actually shown that, that gradients are unstable signals. So we want to kind of create a signal, LRP, that is based and grounded on gradients, but is more stable, okay? It has a conservation guarantee. Okay, so here's the disclaimer about the next uh, slides about LRP. LRP has many formulations and explanations. We chose to focus on the explanation proposed by uh, our paper, but I do encourage you to look at the paper and look at blog posts about LRP if you're interested. Okay, so let's take a look at a simple neural network. We have layer n and layer n minus one, and I do realize that the markings, right, are not as we usually mark them, uh, but in LRP, because we do back propagation, we mark the layers as uh, smaller layers to higher layers, where the first layers get a higher uh, number. So we have xj, um, which uh, results in xi1 and xi2, and we have another neuron here that we don't really account for. 
And the relevance backpropagation in LRP is done in the exact reverse uh, direction from the forward pass, similar to gradients, right? So the forward pass is done from xj to xi1 and xi2, and the relevance backpropagation is done from xi1 and xi2 to xj. And now let's understand how LRP assigns relevance to xj based on the previous layer. So the relevance of xj is going to come from two uh, components, relevance from xi1 to xj and relevance from xi2 to xj. You can see here in uh, blue, the relevance from xi1 to xj, and in purple, the relevance from xi2 to xj. And uh, the relevance is computed in a really simple way. We take the gradient, which actually accounts for how much information was used from xj to compute xi1, right? We multiply it by the actual value of xj, and then this is the relevance value of xi1 in the previous layer. And the relevance value of uh, xi1 is divided by xi1. It's just you know, a technical uh, formulation. You can see here the entire formulation in a formal way. But then the intuition is just taking the gradients and then balancing them with some kind of other values to guarantee the conservation rule, right? So what we're uh, uh, preserving here is that the relevancies of xi1 plus xi2 equals to the relevancies of xj and this neuron. So if the sum of relevancies here is one, then the sum of relevancies here is one as well. And then we kind of mimic the behavior of the attention mechanism where the sum of all, of all, uh, of all rows is preserved. And then the final algorithm is just replacing the attention heads here with the LRP value of the attention heads. So we have the LRP value of the attention heads instead of the attention heads, and as you saw, the LRP is propagated from the last layer, from the prediction, all the way back to the first layer. So the LRP values of the attention heads actually count for all the other layers, right? So if we replace the raw attention value with the LRP value of the attention, we actually obtain a value that is pseudo attention, but takes into account the other layers of the network. So the activations and the feed forward layers and so on. So the final algorithm is taking the attention heads, the LRP value of the attention heads instead of the raw attention, weighting them by the gradients, averaging by uh, this multiplication, and then also adding the identity matrix, which is similar to the rollout algorithm, right, to account for the skip connection. And this is the overall uh, outlook of the algorithm. For each transformer block, we do what we just described, and then to uh, account for the different attention layers, we multiply uh, the attention matrices that we calculated here, which is also similar to rollout, okay? So the aggregation across the layers is actually done similar to rollout, and we do add the, uh, the identity matrix similar to rollout. Okay, observing some results, you can see that our method is able to actually create salient features that are corresponding to uh, the inputs. Um, also, because we use gradients, right, the gradients are specific to the class that we wanted to embed. We propagated the gradients with regards to a specific class, a specific logic. So if we have two subjects in the image, say a dog and the cat, we can propagate the relevance with regards to the dog and the cat separately. And you can see different heat maps for each one of the subjects in the image. It also works on uh, sentiment analysis because, as we said, the transformer is kind of a, a global architecture employed for all disciplines. So I'm not sure if you can see because it's kind of small, but you can take the same text and uh, propagate gradients with regards to negative sentiment and positive sentiment. And then you can see that the text is highlighted where the negative parts are shown here and where the positive parts are shown here. So for example, positive is enthusiasm, joy, entertainment, and negative is doesn't, hard, uh, joyless, and stuff like that. This actually works uh, quite well for VQA as well. So if we're asking the model what signs are above the person, usually VQA models don't really explain themselves, right? They just give you some kind of a prediction. So you're not sure if the model actually made the classification based on the right reasons. So for example, here you can see what signs are above the person. The model actually looks at the signs above the person. So you can know that the model made a prediction at least based on the right regions in the image. What is causing the shadows on the ground? You can see that the model is again looking at the shadows on the ground. And by the way, these uh, kind of explanations sometimes show that the model looks at the entirely wrong thing to make the prediction. So these are positive examples, but they're negative examples as well. 
We do have another method presented at ICCB 21, um, which also works for multimodal transformers. We don't have the time to get into it, but I will show some results. So this is the first result. So we have a uh, um, object detection model. This is specifically DTR. And then we can turn our object detection model into a semantic segmentation model. So for example, we can see that in this uh, cats and uh, remotes example, the, uh, the object detector detects both remotes and cats. And you can see that if you propagate the relevance with regards to each one of these detections, you can get a semantic segmentation map of where the object is in the image. So really extracting semantic segmentation from object detection models. Another thing that has been used a lot by other works is explanations for CLIP, okay? So we do know that CLIP can take an input image and a text and then output a score as to how much the image corresponds to the text. So then we can propagate the relevance with regards to the score of the image with a specific text to see where the model finds the text in the image. So for example, this image of an elephant and a zebra next to a lake, we can give the, the model the text an elephant and see that the model kind of identifies correctly where the elephant is in the image. So the relevance map can actually show us the location of the object in the image given that the model is expressive enough to understand different texts. So the model can show us where an elephant is, where a zebra is, and where a lake is. And here's the cool part of using explainability. Explainability is really useful for downstream tasks as well. So these explanations that we saw for CLIP were actually used for quite a lot of downstream tasks. So this is an example of using explainability for um, text and video editing. So what we want to do here, this is a work, by the way, from uh, the Weizmann Institution. Uh, what we want to do here is take an input image and edit it according to a uh, target text. So we want to take this image of a woman with a brown hat and turn the uh, hat red. So maybe the first thing that we want to do in the editing task is identify where the hat is in the image, right? So what we can do is we can insert the image with the text hat to clip, then obtain the relevancy maps as we saw here. As you can see here, this is the relevancy map and identify where the hat is in the image such that the algorithm can now edit the correct part in the image and turn the hat red from brown. And as you can see, without using relevancy maps as bootstrap, um, there are many additional artifacts to the image, meaning her face kind of turns red and not just the hat. Here's another example from a paper that won a best paper at CGRAPH 22. Uh, it's called Clipasso, also from Tel Aviv University. And the goal of this paper is to take an input image and create a sketch at different levels of abstraction. So you can see this flamingo here and the sketches here are different levels of abstraction. This is very detailed and this is very abstract. So in order to create different levels of abstraction, we can use the hit maps or the relevancy maps for the image and then place the strokes, the most important strokes in the most salient parts of the image such as the most salient parts of the image get their corresponding strokes and we can create abstractions at different levels. So explainability is actually useful for a lot of downstream tasks as well. I will say that there are many additional methods to explain transformers, okay? I just mentioned briefly uh, three of them, but there are a lot others. Um, for, for example, Covert et al. Uh, did uh, Shapely values estimation for vision transformers. There are people using Markov chains for vision transformers and so many more that we're not mentioning in this talk. So if you're interested, just feel free to check out the papers that cited the papers that I discussed uh, during this talk. And obviously, we're not able to cover everything. Here's the list of resources that we use during this talk. And you do have call-up notebooks and demos where you can interactively uh, show explanations using different methods and see the difference between methods for CNNs and transformers. OK, so this wraps up this part of the tutorial. In the next part of the tutorial, we're going to talk about how to use attention as explanation for models like Dino. So let's take a five minute break and get back to it. Please confirm that you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, so we're going to move to the fourth part of the tutorial. Hang tight, it's going to be really interesting. Um, moving to Saya. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the part four of our tutorial, where I wanted to present some interesting approaches uh, of using attention as probable explanations. Uh, but I wanted to present some different approaches of taking a look at it.
specifically, I wanted to discuss how imposing a clear separation uh, in between the responsibilities of the CLS token and the special tokens and their corresponding uh, attention layers uh, could help us better interpret and explain uh, what, what's typically learned uh, in the attention layers. And I also wanted to discuss the role of pre-training strategies in the development of saliency of different uh, objects that sort of emerge uh, from the input images. Uh, so let's uh, try to revisit the self-attention block uh, present in the vision transformer networks. Uh, uh, so the inputs that we feed to the first transformer encoder block of a WIT model are the embeddings computed uh, from the learnable CLS token and also the embeddings computed from the patches extracted uh, from the input images. Typically, these two embeddings are concatenated and then they are fed to the first transformer encoder block and representations are computed and sort of fed uh, through the rest of the transformer encoder uh, blocks in the network. Now, uh, the, response, uh, the responsibility uh, of the self-attention layers here are twofold. They are responsible for learning the dependencies uh, in between the image patch tokens, but they are also responsible for summarizing the uh, information from those image patch tokens into a CLS token from which we eventually pull the representations and feed that to uh, the classification head uh, when we are dealing with the image, image classification objective. Now, an idea here is to is uh, what if it could be better separated? What if we could delegate the delegate the responsibilities of the attention layers in a better manner, uh, which is what was uh, explored in the uh, going deep with image transformers paper, where they introduced this idea of class attention. Uh, specifically, uh, they uh, they proposed that uh, a set of attention layers will just focus on uh, the image patches and a potentially smaller uh, set of attention layers will just focus on modeling the interplay in between the image patches and the class token. So this is how it would uh, pictorially look like. As we can see, uh, the CLS token is not immediately introduced uh, as, as we start traversing through the network. It's actually introduced uh, at a much later stage. And uh, and when we introduce the CLS token, uh, the patch embeddings computed in the earlier half of the network, they are kept frozen. Uh, and the transformer blocks after the CLS token uh, is introduced in the network, uh, they, uh, they, they implement something called class, uh, class attention rather than the self attention. Now, I have uh, taken uh, the representations uh, extracted from the different heads uh, present in the class attention layers. Uh, the first row uh, uh, denotes the first class attention layer introduced uh, at a later stage uh, in the smallest uh, CAIT, which is class attention image transformers network. And the second row uh, uh, denotes the second class attention layer. Uh, but basically, just note that uh, these visualizations were taken from the smallest vari uh, variant of the CAIT network, which, which is short for class attention image transformer, introduced in the going deeper with image transformers paper. Now, uh, one thing uh, that, that becomes evident at this point in time uh, is that uh, the different heads uh, present in the first attention layer of first class attention layer, they are responsible uh, for focusing on the class specific objects uh, as well as the other complementary parts uh, needed to arrive at a particular classification decision. Whereas the heads uh, present in the second class attention layer, they focus uh, more on the global uh, context of the uh, image. Now, uh, another, another probably very traditional uh, question here is to ask what's actually present in those attention maps. Uh, at least uh, answering this question from a visual perspective is uh, is being practiced uh, since ages. So here's exactly uh, here's we are gonna do that exactly. So typically we start from an input image, 
We then extract the attention scores, uh, typically the softmax uh, attention scores, and then we average the softmax attention scores from multiple different heads. And then we reshape and upsample the attention maps. Uh, and then we basically visualize the attention map. And here I'm uh, using uh, I'm using the last transformer block uh, from a vision transform uh, transformer based model trained using the Dino pre-training strategy introduced in emerging properties uh, in self-supervised vision transformers paper. Now you you might think that this is nothing new. Uh, this is being practiced since ages and. I hear you, and I also, in fact, agree this is nothing new. Um, what is it? Now, if we closely uh, look at this uh, figure, uh, we, uh, we will agree that the uh, automatic discovery of the semantic layouts for a supervised vision transformer is not that well pronounced uh, in comparison to that of a self-supervised vision transformer, even when uh, the supervised vision transformer was probably pre-trained on a much uh, larger data set. Uh, so yeah, and here are some more examples. And on the right-hand side, we can see there's little to none uh, automatic semantic layout discovery uh, for, a, uh, for a supervised uh, vision transformer, but that's apparently not the case for a self-supervised vision transformer. And if you run these experiments across many different images, you will also be able to uh, observe similar findings. Now, here, here, here are two key points here. The attention maps seem to contain the semantic layout of different objects uh, present in the input images, uh, because, but they did not receive any uh, supervisory signals uh, during their pre-training objectives. The pre-training objective was entirely self-supervised. Uh, so uh, as a direct function of the pre-training objective, this automatic uh, discovery of semantic layouts of different objects, that sort of uh, came out as a byproduct of the pre-training strategy. Uh, but with, uh, as we saw earlier, uh, with uh, supervised pre-training, uh, the layout discovery part become uh, very sparse. So that's it uh, for this section. Uh, it was short. Uh, and here are some resources, uh, notebooks, and demos for you to check out. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sai, for this very interesting coverage um, that we just saw. Hang tight because after this five minute break, we're going to talk to Ron, who's already on Zoom here. Hi, Ron. Uh, and Ron's going to talk hey. to us about some of his very seminal works on leveraging attention for text to image editing. So exciting. We'll be back in five minutes. Okay, everyone. So break is over. And now I think we're coming right about to one of the most interesting parts of this tutorial. Uh, we have our guest speaker, Ron Mukadi. So thank you so much, Ron, for joining us at such a late hour from uh, Tel Aviv right now. Hi, Ron. Um, I'll yield the floor to you. Just feel free to present your screen and yeah. Great. OK, so hi, everyone. Greetings from Tel Aviv. Uh, here it's evening, as the last said, but I hope you're all having a wonderful day in Vancouver, uh, probably eating sushi or watching whales or other, other fun stuff. Uh, Really wish I could be there with you, uh, but maybe we could be at the ICCV, uh, hopefully. So my name is Ron, and today we'll talk about image editing with diffusion models. And specifically, I'll be focusing on the prompt-to-prompt -prompt approach, which every, heavily relies on attention. Okay, so let's dive in. Great. So 2022 was definitely the year of the text guided diffusion models. And I don't think I need to say much about the quality of the results. Like you all probably remember the first time you generated a high quality image using text. Uh, this one was my first. So for the few who are not familiar with these models, basically random noise is mapped to highly diverse images guided by only text through a sequence of denoising steps. However, here's the thing. While these models are absolutely mind-blowing when it comes to generating content, they aren't exactly built with image, 
image editing in mind. So let's say you want to generate a cat on a bicycle. You try several times and generally pleased with this particular result. But what if you actually prefer a green bicycle? The most intuitive and natural way is just adding the word green to the prompt and regenerating. However, even with the same random seed, you get a different cat. And if we want to replace the cat with a koala, now the color of the bicycle is changed. And same things happens for replacing the grass with treats or asking for a bicycle made out of candies. So this was our motivation for prompt to prompt which enables us to preserve the structure and composition in the original image so we can intuitively edit generated images using only text. As you can see, we can now easily edit our favorite cat. So how does it work? Our key observation is that the cross-attention maps that was mentioned earlier in this talk, deep inside our model, control the relations between pixels and words. And therefore, we can preserve the structure of the original image by injecting these attention maps, which are visualized here. For example, we start with this lemon cake. Again, using the same seed results in completely different cakes. By injecting the internal cross-attention maps, which produce the original image, we can finally get a square chocolate cake or even a square pasta cake. So to replace this cat with a different animal, we replace a word in the prompt while injecting the attention. getting these cool animals sitting on the chair. So by limiting the injection to only part of the diffusion step, we can intuitively control the fidelity to the original image. Here we try to replace the bicycle with the car. So note how too many results in a bicycle, while too few results in a completely different composition. We can also inject self-attention which maintains the image structure more firmly, but does not correlate to the text tokens. Since we still want to allow some degrees of freedom, we use self-attention for only about 20% of the steps. If we wish to add a new phrase to the prompt, we only inject the maps of the original prompt tokens. For example, here, we specify different hats for our cat. So we inject only attention maps of the other parts of the image. Okay. So many editing operations are naturally global, as you can see here, which affect the entire image, right? You can see, for example, the, the reflection on the car window. which is pretty cool, but we can also perform local editing. And again, we use the attention map itself to limit the editing to a specific region. But here is the really cool part. We can even control the intensity of the effect induced by a specific word by scaling its tension map. For instance, we make the hat gradually more floral. I also like to think about it as intuitive fade and control. Here we can make the doll more or less fluffy. By the way, can you hear me well still? There is some echo, right? Um, maybe. Let me just try to move the mic so it doesn't affect you. Maybe maybe it's better now. Sorry for that. Yeah. Sheila, if you could mute yourself, probably that would be yeah. useful. Yeah, because... sure. Okay. So let's continue. So 
this was very cool. Uh, I hope you also think so. Uh, but all these examples were generated. How can we edit real images, which do not just show up with attention maps? So this requires a process called inversion. Given an input image and a textual prompt, we need to find a noise vector which can reproduce the input image when fed to the generator. Then at inference, we fit this noise vector when using prompt to prompt, resulting in meaningful editing while preserving the appearance of the original image faithfully. So for this purpose, we design a new inversion scheme for diffusion models called null text inversion. It consists of two components. The first is the pivotal inversion for diffusion. We observe that other approaches aim to map all noise vectors to a single or couple of images during training. This is highly inefficient as only one noise vector is used at inference. Instead, we use a single noise vector, but how can we get this vector? We first consider the direct DDM inversion. Without classify free guidance, the DDM inversion reconstruct the image well, but it is not editable and the classifier free guidance is essential for our editing. Using classifier free guidance for both inversion and inference completely fails. Using classifier free guidance on it inference is not accurate, but does provide a pretty good starting point for our optimization. So we use the DDM inversion to produce a latent trajectory from the original image, Z0, to a noise vector Z. Fitting this noise vector to the diffusion process results in distortion when the classifier free guidance is applied, as the latent code become farther away from the original trajectory. Inspired by the pivotal tuning inversion approach, we consider the DDM inversion trajectory as a pivot and perform a second step optimization around this anchor. More specifically, we aim to bring the diffusion backward trajectory closer to the original image encoding. Ideally, if the trajectory will be identical in both directions, we will get a perfect reconstruction. So we start with ZT, and for each timestamp, try to get as close as possible to the pivot trajectory. In other words, we perform an optimization for each timestamp where the pivot is the relevant latent code from the DDM inversion. So now it is left to show you the optimization itself. Here's the thing. Fine tuning in the entire model is highly expressive, but inefficient. That's why we've come up with a more efficient approach called non-text optimization. But first I need to explain classifier free guidance. This is an essential component designed to amplify the effect of the text guidance. It consists of performing the prediction twice in each diffusion step, once with text condition, and once unconditionally with null text embedding. These predictions are then extrapolated. While all works concentrate in tuning the model or the conditional prediction, we recognize the substantial effect induced by the unconditional part. And therefore, we only optimize the embedding using the unconditional part, replacing the null text embedding with the objective of getting closer to the pivot. So putting it all together, we kick things off with ZT. And for each timestamp, we kick the null text embedding to get as close as possible to the latent codes we got from the initial DDM inversion. Then these optimized embeddings are used as inference to faithfully reconstruct the image. And of course, we use the attention injection as we do, as we used in prompt to prompt to perform our editing. So now I can edit the photo of my daughter. And as you can see, the edited images maintain the high level of fidelity to both original image and target text without any tuning to the model or the text embedding. The downside 
is that this optimization takes about a minute. So how can we make it faster? So if you listen to me so far, you know the answer. We can inject attention again. And this was presented in the awesome plug and play paper where the attention actually fix the DDM distortion instead of performing optimization. So we can actually edit images in just a matter of seconds while keeping the facial identity intact. And guess what? Preserving facial identity is like the holy grail of image editing, the biggest challenge out there. So this is very exciting. And to wrap it up, prompt to prompt, pr sorry, prompt to prompt, unleash the power of attention in these user models. Later studies have consistently demonstrated that attention is the go-to editing tool for current diffusion models. For example, it can be used for video editing as well, as you can see here. Another example is in struct pix to pix that uses prompt to prompt to create synthetic data set for image editing. So we can now train an editing model that can actually edit real images based on simple text instruction. How cool is that? And another example is the inside-outside paper that uses attention to carefully control the relation between foreground and background during editing. So that's it. Thank you for listening. And uh, please visit our project page for more information. Uh, also, the poster of the null text paper will be presented by Danny Koenor and maybe also by Kfir, uh, which is a really great opportunity to meet them uh, if you wish to. Uh, and I will be happy to answer any questions. Uh, I think I finished pretty fast, huh? Thank you so much, Juan. It was really fascinating. The people here are clapping for you. I'm sure you can see them, but you can feel the vibes. Thank you so much for showing us how powerful attention can be for image editing. It was really fascinating. If you have any questions for Juan from the audience, feel free to just approach the mic and I'll convey the questions to Zoom. And uh, other participants, please feel free to ask Juan questions via Rocket Chat. We'll convey the questions to him and then get back to you. Thank you, Juan. So unless there are any questions, uh, we'll take a five minute break and then get back to how to use attention for text to image editing. Okay. So let's get back to the final technical part of the tutorial. Yay, <laughs> we're here. Uh, we're going to, to, con to continue talking about attention for downstream tasks. So if you notice in, in Ron's talk, he showed some pretty cool and amazing things that can be done with attention. So we're going to touch a bit more about the things you can do with attention for downstream tasks. So as I said in the beginning of the tutorial, attention is used basically in any model today. So also generative models rely heavily on attention, on cross attention. And we'll see that in the next slides. We'll also see how cross attention can be used to correct the generations by a, a text to image model. So we're going to talk about a work uh, co-authored by me called Attend and Excite. And then Attend and Excite is tasked with taking a text to image model and correcting the images produced by the text to image model. So first we're going to uh, present the issue of catastrophic neglect, which is the issue that we're trying to resolve. Then we're going to talk about introduction to latent diffusion models to kind of understand how the model works and what we want to fix about the model. We're going to talk about the method we propose called generative semantic nursing, and then we're going to show some results. So let's start with an introduction to text-based image generation. So these examples were actually generated by LDM, I think, and all these images were generated using just simple text prompts. So you can see that these images are both diverse and very creative and imaginative. So these models were trained on actual real images, but then they're able to produce images that are really imaginative and creative. So for example, here we have a teddy bear in space who is an astronaut. 
we have this lizard conducting experiments in a lab, and we have Darth Vader riding a bike in the forest. So these models seem to be really, really expressive and creative. But then when you try to uh, generate conjunctions of very simple subjects, such as a cat and a dog, the model often fails miserably. So these are actually results generated by stable diffusion. And we can see that a cat is not actually generated in the image. And even the dog kind of looks distorted. It has you know, two heads and uh, two dogs are kind of connected and mushed together. So the question that we're asking in this work in the tendon excite is why is this happening? Is this an issue of expressiveness where the model can simply not generate two subjects in the same scene? Or is it an issue of neglect where the model chooses to kind of ignore some parts of the input text to make the generation process easier? And then if that's the case, maybe we can fix that. So in order to understand what's going on and why the model is failing, we first need to understand how the model works. So a tendon excite operates over stable diffusion. And stable diffusion is a type of a latent diffusion model. And a latent diffusion model is a model that performs the diffusion process on a latent space. We use a latent space instead of the original image space to save time and, uh, and space. Yeah. So here is a chart of how the training process of a latent diffusion model works. So we have our input image X, which we wish to reconstruct, right? The model is trained to reconstruct the training images. And the image X is encoded into its corresponding latent Z using an autoencoder here. And then the entire diffusion process operates on the latent space, such that we do not operate on the original image to save, as I said, time and space. And then this is actually the interesting part. This is how image generation happens. Image generation is achieved by taking a random latent noise ZT and then gradually denoising it at each denoising step using the text. So the text is injected into the diffusion models using the cross attention mechanism. So the cross attention mechanism actually takes the information from the text and fuses it into the latent ZT that is used by the model. And then gradually the model leverages the information from the text to denoise a random noise latent into a clean latent C. Once we have our clean latent, which contains the entire information about the image, we can decode it back to the image space to generate our output image. And this is how a diffusion model or a latent diffusion model works in general, right? If you're not familiar with diffusion models, that's okay. We're going to focus mostly on the cross attention mechanism, which is going to relate to our entire tutorial. So no worries about that. So let's take a closer look about this cross attention mechanism and how the conditioning on text is, ha is happening. So here's an example of a prompt and a degeneration by stable diffusion. The prompt here is a lion with a crown. And we can see that the model generated the lion perfectly, but there is no crown generated in the image, right? So let's take a look at the cross attention maps to see if we can understand why the crown was neglected from the uh, output image. So as I said before, the unit, which is the diffusion model, is tasked with taking a noisy input latent ZT and producing a slightly less noisy output latent ZT minus one. And then this is done using the cross attention mechanism, which injects information about the text. So let's take a look at the cross attention maps. As we said before, when you do cross attention, the queries come from the main domain, in this case, the image, and the keys come from the contextualizing domain, meaning the text. Therefore, our attention maps looks like this, um, such that the rows correspond to the different image patches, right? So if we have P by P patches, we have P squared rows, and the columns correspond to the text uh, tokens. So each one of the rows here is going to correspond to a single patch in the image. So for example, the first row in the attention map is going to correspond to the first patch in the image. And the values of the attention are going to tell us which tokens are generated in the first parts of the image. So the tokens that are going to get the high attention values in the first row are going to be manifested in the first patch in the image, right? So then the attention gives us an immediate result as to the presence of each token in each patch. But then observe that each of these columns refers to a single token, right? If we take the, this column, it refers to the presence of the token in each one of the patches in the image. So we take each one of the columns and then reshape it to be P by P. And now we get a spatial attention map for each one of the tokens. So what you're seeing here is the attention activation of each token throughout the image. 
And you can see that for the two subjects here, lion and crown, we get very two different attention maps. So for the lion, we see that the lion gets very high attention activations where the lion is actually generated in the image. But then we can see that the attention map for the crown is kind of zero, zero activations throughout the entire image, right? So the attention maps are actually telling us that the line is generated here in the image, while the crown is not generated anywhere in the image because all the attention activations for the crown are low. So the problem becomes, this is the essence of the problem, right? This is the reason for the problem. The reason that the crown is not generated is that no patch in the cross-attention mechanism attended to the token crown. If there was a patch attending to the token crown, then the crown would get high activation somewhere in the image and it would be generated, right? So these cross-attention maps kind of show us immediately which subject is generated in the image and where. And now we've kind of pinpointed the issue that causes uh, the lack of generation of some subjects. Low attention equals no generation. So those tokens who have low attention throughout the entire image will not be generated or manifested in the resulting image. So now that we understand the problem, let's think about how we can fix this. And this idea of generative semantic nursing is actually pretty cool. Because what we're doing is we're taking these attention maps and we're trying to um, encourage the model to change the attention map. We're trying to encourage the latent to manipulate these attention maps to uh, uphold some criteria. So let's take a look at the maximal attention patch. We know that the lion is generated in the image. Therefore, the maximal attention patch will have a very, very high activation, right? Close to one. But then the maximal attention patch for the crown will be very low. So we can formulate a loss function for each one of the subjects that captures this behavior specifically. So for the lion, we're going to take the complementary of the maximal attention value. And then since we know that the lion is generated in the image, this maximal attention value is going to be very high and the complementary is going to be very low. Therefore, this loss is going to be very close to zero. But then for the crown, this loss is going to be very high because the highest activation is very low. So this loss actually captures something that is really very intuitive. Take a look at the cross attention maps and then ask ourselves, is the object generated in the, the maps or not generated in the maps? And then we can formulate our overall loss function as just taking the most neglected subject, meaning which subject has the lowest attention value. And the idea would be to try to encourage the model to strengthen the attention for the most neglected token. So what we're going to do is a simple gradient descent set. So we have our input latent DT, our, our input noisy, noisy latent. What we're going to do is to guide it towards uh, paying more attention to the crown, right? So we have our input latent, which is manifested by the queries of the attention mechanism. So what we're going to do is we're going to shift it a tiny bit, such that we encourage the maximal attention path for the crown to be a bit higher, meaning pay more attention to the most neglected token. This is actually equivalent to just repeating this process of calculating and cross attention, but slightly shifting or slightly changing the queries matrix. So we're encouraging the queries to attend more to the neglected subject. Um, you may wonder if this is enough, right? What if we have multiple subjects? Here we had just two subjects and then taking the most neglected subject made sense because we only had one neglected subject. So if we reinforce high attention on the crown, we get better generation for all the subjects in the prompt. But what happens if we have three or four or five or 10 subjects in our, in our prompt? We want to encourage the generation of all subjects. What we do is we use a process called uh, iterative refinement. And then we take a look at specific, a specific denoising step. ZT uh, goes into the unit. Here, the cross attention is calculated and is mapped to ZT minus one, which is slightly less noisy. We compute the loss for ZT and then we shift ZT according to the loss, such that we encourage ZT to attend to the most neglected subject. But then we compute the loss again. Now say the crown gets a high attention value, right? Because we shifted ZT with ZT tag, but then say the lion gets a low attention value all of a sudden. Then we compute the loss function again. And if the loss function is low enough, meaning if all subjects are attended to, we can go on to the next step of the generation. But if the attention values for some of the subjects is not low or, or high enough, we can repeat the process until the attention values for all the subjects is high enough, right? So this process is iterative. It repeats itself until a certain attention threshold 
is reached for all the subjects, meaning we ensure that all the subjects are actually generated in the image. And so we have to be careful when doing iterative refinement because what we're doing in the process is actually shifting the latent ZT, right? If you shift the latent ZT too much, you're in danger of kind of pushing it out of the distribution. And you don't want to do that, obviously. So what we're doing is we're only using iterative refinement at certain time steps of the denoising process, at time steps 0, 5, and 20, to avoid kind of moving out of the distribution. And we're doing it gradually, such that in the time step 0, we demand an, a minimal attention value of 0 0.05, which is a low attention value. And then in the fifth uh, denoising step, we demand an attention value of 0.2, which is slightly higher. And then in the 20th uh, um, denoising step, we demand uh, an attention value of 0.8. So we gradually, this is why I call it semantic nursing, we gradually nurse the model to attend to all subjects. We don't do it too uh, violently to avoid uh, shifting the latent ZT too much such that it's out of distribution. And this semantic guidance actually works pretty nice. You can take a look at the example of the line that we had before that had no crown. After applying this guidance to uh, the denoising steps, you can see that the lion is generated with a crown. So basically what we did is we took a look at each denoising step in the DDPM process. We extracted the cross attention maps and formulated the loss directly on the attention maps. So this just go to sh goes to show the power of the attention maps on the guidance of the model. So as Ron showed you for prompt to prompt and null text inversion, you can actually use the attention maps to perform pretty powerful editings and also guidance on the model. Basically, the intuition behind this method is taking the explanations by the model, these cross attention maps that show us an explanation of each subject and where it's generated, and manipulate the explanations of the model. So once we have that tool of understanding the model and how it works, we can manipulate the explanations of the model to be healthier or better or fit some criteria that we can define. And here are examples of some results of this process. So this is the prompt, a cat and a dog, very, really a basic prompt that we saw in the beginning of the talk. So you can see that stable diffusion fails to generate both a cat and a dog in the same scene, right? So it's either two cats or a mesh of a cat and a dog. And here are two different methods that we compare to as baselines. You can see that they both um, fall short of generating both subjects. And even when they do, the subjects kind of look weird. Um, the mouth positioning doesn't look natural. But then when using our method attend and excite, you can observe that two things happen. The first thing, both subjects are generated in the output image, which is positive, right? We solve the catastrophic neglect of the subject. And the second thing, which is something that I really like, is um, the objects are very diverse. So we have different breeds and different colors of dogs and cats here. So we didn't harm the diversity or creativity of the model. Another thing that we've noticed, which was not intended originally, is another uh, semantic issue with uh, stable diffusion. If you notice here, we ask for a red bench and a yellow clock. So there are attributes to bind to each one of the subjects, meaning the bench should be red and the clock should be yellow. So we can see that even when stable diffusion generates both subjects, it kind of binds the attributes wrong. The clock is red and the bench is yellow instead of the other way around. So if we notice is when using a tendon site, not only are we able to mitigate the uh, catastrophic neglect, we are also able to significantly, significantly alleviate the problem of uh, attribute bindings. You can see that all the clocks here are yellow and all the benches are red and also Something that I think is really cool, the uh, hours on the clock are actually generated correctly, which is kind of nice. Okay, so as I said before, uh, generating multiple subjects can be really challenging. So here you can see examples of multiple subjects in the same scene and see that uh, Tendon Excite is still able to generate all subjects. So this is a playful kitten chasing a butterfly in a wildflower meadow. And you can see the stable diffusion doesn't really capture the scene originally. But then when using a tendon excite, all the subjects are generated. And also the cat kind of seems to chase the butterfly around, which fits the prompt nicely. Here's another complex prompt, a grizzly bear catching a salmon in a crystal clear river surrounded by forest. So definitely complicated. And stable diffusion fails to generate the scene. But then when using a tendon excite, all these subjects are generated. And the bear kind of seems to catch the salmon in different creative ways, which is also cool. And here's the point that I wish to convey more than anything in this talk. 
what we did was actually take the cross attention maps, those explanations that we extracted from the model, and think about how we can formulate the loss function directly on the explanation. So manipulating the explanation is a really, really powerful tool. Once you understand your models, you can kind of manipulate the explanations to encourage healthier behaviors. So explanations are not just useful for detection of biases or better understanding or deeper understanding of the model. Once you understand your model better, you can actually leverage those explanations for downstream tasks. You can improve the model, improve its accuracy, improve its robustness, and so on. We do have another work at NeurIP 22 showing that you can improve robustness of image classifiers using explanations. So explanations are a really powerful tool for generation, for downstream tasks, and also for understanding the model and its biases. Um, so here you have some uh, information about this talk and the paper and also uh, an interactive demo when it, where you can play around with attend and excite and see how it attends to different subjects in the image. Um, this was the final technical part. So we're going to take a five minute break and then go over to the conclusions where we'll discuss open questions. Um, so it's worth sticking around for the other parts of the tutorial. Thank you so much. And if you have questions, feel free to just reach out. Okay, thanks everyone for sticking around for the final part of this tutorial, which is the conclusions part. Uh, Saik, do you want to take this part? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, so uh, we'll now hear Saik about the conclusions to kind of wrap up everything we learned during this tutorial. Take it away. All right, just confirm if I'm visible, if my screen is also visible and I'm audible. Yes and yes and yes. Oh, okay, cool. Triple yes. All right. Uh, thanks to our in-person attendees as well as virtual attendees. Thanks for uh, keeping your questions coming uh, in numbers. And also, most importantly, thanks so much for showing up. Uh, it really means a lot. Uh, so in this section, we wanted to summarize uh, our tutorial. Uh, and we also wanted to equ equip uh, our audience with the open questions that are very much active into the play. Uh, so just to summarize, we of course started with an introduction to transformers and what self-attention uh, self -attention layers mean in the context of transformers. And then we uh, sort of proceeded to probe what vision transformers learn. Specifically, we learned about tools like mean attention distance uh, we also compared the similarities, uh, similarity in between uh, the representation spaces learned by vision transformers and resnets. And we used a tool called centered kernel alignment uh, to do that. And then we also studied the role of skip connection and uh, the level of influ influence they have uh, on vision transformers as well as resnets. Uh, and then we uh, had a brief section on explaining attention uh, where we studied techniques like attention flow and attention rollout uh, and then we compared uh, its uh, its its cons and we introduced a method called tiva uh, and then we also uh, tried to take a look at different visualizations using these methods to explain different uh, modalities uh, and then we uh, studied class attention and also the automatic semantic layout discovery in the attention maps as a way to use uh, attention uh, as an explanation. Uh, and finally, this is probably one of the most important takeaways of this tutorial where we discussed how attention can be used uh, for downstream applications. Uh, Ron gave us a beautiful overview of prompt to prompt and null inversion and Hila uh, uh, discussed her paper on attend and excite, all were basically based on the theme that attention can actually be leveraged uh, for downstream applications as well. Now, several open questions remain uh, at this point in time. First one, uh, of course, la just like other things, this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, so yeah, feel free to take it with a pinch of salt. So the first open question is how do we even evaluate these explainability tools and how do we even define what a good explanation method is in the first place. Uh, so there's some work around this area. Uh, uh, in, in particular, this paper called what I cannot predict, I do not understand. Uh, this paper introduced a metric called the usefulness metric, 
which basically tries to dissect uh, an explainability method in terms of how 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 valuable it is to the end user and it tries to uh, use the usefulness metric in terms of things like how how helpful it is for the in, uh, end user to identify the source of bias in a particular uh, in a particular model uh, uh, with, by using a particular explanation uh, method and also whether or not it helps the end user to understand and identify the failure cases uh, of a particular model then there's another aspect of faithfulness uh, to the model uh, where we try to investigate what features uh, from the inputs were used by uh, by a model to arrive uh, at a decision and we use several methods for that uh, now are these methods actually robust uh, to the kind of state of the model being used for example uh, in this paper sanity checks for saliency maps uh, in this paper the authors show that even with a completely uh, randomly initialized network uh, the saliency maps uh, extracted using different explanation methods they kind of remain the same uh, as we can see uh, in the picture as well uh, so what's truly happening here like is it just because of the uh, power of the random features uh, of the neural networks or i mean there's there's still a there's still uh, an amount of uh, black boxness uh, in this methods it seems like or are they just are they just outputting uh, a heat map that just looks nice uh, and other than that uh, they're nothing else so there's a there's a there's a matter of mystery here uh, then there's another way to take a look at it to evaluate how good are these explanations where we try to ask given a particular definition of uh, of an explainability method how do we evaluate uh, the explanations produced by it so typically hila also mentioned mentioned it uh, earlier uh, uh, typically we try to remove the most uh, important or the least important pixels uh, predicted by a method from the input pixels and observe the degradation in the accuracy but then again these these methods are highly problematic because as we try to remove certain pixels uh, from the inputs they also induce uh, an out of distribution data set so it's truly kind of unclear, uh, unclear to note whether or not this degradation in in the model's predictive performance are they truly coming from the uh, from the absence of the important features or or they are simply an artifact of uh, the distributional shift that's happening on the data level. So that's why it's still an active area of research. Then then uh, in this in this in this figure uh, we are seeing two two uh, visualizations of explanations uh, we are prompting two different variants of the clip model uh, uh, with with a, uh, with the following caption uh, a man with eyeglasses and uh, for the smaller smaller clip, clip model uh, which is clipped with uh, a vision, vision transformer base 16 variant which is which is a smaller one uh, than the bit L14 variant. And for the smaller one, we can see the explainability method seems to produce uh, seems to produce a pretty dense explanation. Uh, but with the larger larger variant of the clip model, it it actually introduced some noise. So what's happening here? Are the representation spaces uh, of these two models very different or or is it the case where the explainability methods are actually favoring uh, the smaller models more? And then, of course, we know that transformers are not just about attention. Uh, they're much more than that. There's, a, there's, there's an entire component on feed forward networks uh, that, that, that sort of uh, uh, proceed uh, the attention layers. So we might want to ask questions like where is this learned information actually encoded uh, and is it correct or is it salient enough to just focus the research on attention because even even in our tutorial uh, for the most part we focus just on the attention bit uh, but we need to go beyond that because for large language models it has already been shown that a lot of information actually is encoded in the feed forward 
uh, feed forward networks where the authors interpreted them as key value uh, memories where keys uh, represent the textual patterns typically discovered from the inputs uh, and the value uh, sort of induce a distribution uh, of the output vocabulary. So how do we extend this observation to multiple modalities? So yeah, and these are all the resources uh, for the final section. And I think that's about it. We are four minutes, four minutes late, but yeah, that's about it. Okay, thank you very much so much for attending our tutorial. Thank you, Sayak, for joining us so late in India. And uh, thank you for the remote participants for joining in different time zones. We love to have you here uh, during these three hours. If you have any questions, feel, please feel free to email both of us. We'd be happy to answer even offline. Thank you very much for participating. Thank you. Bye.